adult procedural sedation. So this is sort of a nice sort of, you know, we do this all the time. I think it's sort of good to have a review. And it's, it's sort of nice to see like what other countries yeah, it is. are doing. Here. It is. So they've incorporated the ASEP policy on procedural sedation from 2023. They also have the Royal College of Emergency Medicine Best Practice Guidelines on Procedural... I can't go. do it in an accent. I wish I could, but <laughs> I can't. <laughs> can't tap into my British accent. And then um, they're and it's still using some information from the 2014 version that came out. Yeah, so basically an updated version, the old yeah. version, and we bring in the Royal College. Yeah. So the policy statement here, right, so it's really saying that emergency physicians are trained to administer procedural sedation and should not be required additional training to be credentialed it's for It's so sad they have sedation. to keep reiterating this. The fact this. that we had to say that out loud to some of our critics, you know, critiques out there yeah. from different specialties, mm -hmm. just gonna we'll leave just that re-emphasize that, but pull that up if anybody gives you grief. Let's hope not anymore, mm -hmm. but anyway. So to uh, provide procedural sedation, which agents to choose should be individualized for every patient, right? We do this all the time. All the time. All the time to figure out which one would be best based on what's going on and why you're sedating. And like, yeah. exactly, right? All physicians and staff involved in sedation are expected to be familiar with the drugs and to manage potential complications. And Including the, and staff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Including over sedation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so I think this is a key piece here. Where it's not just the physicians. Like mm -hmm. the nurses have to be familiar, right? You've got RTs involved. They need to be familiar so that we can. And all they're be often on the your lifesaver at the time. They're the right. one that notices something's right. changing. So. Especially if you're the one doing the procedure. Like you need to have them be your extra eyes. Okay. So I like this table because it goes by sort of adverse event. Mm -hmm. Like so. I mean, we don't necessarily I think the way we're taught traditionally is to think about it like memorize each drug and the dose and the contraindications and the adverse blah, blah, blah. but like I like this framework because it's it's very oriented in what you don't want to happen mm -hmm. right like I have a That's patient true. that comes in and they need sedation for their shoulder it's very different than so-and-so needs a sedation for something that's much more complicated like it, you know and so it gives you a sense of like the thing that I don't want I'm not choosing that drug right and so by so you so we know agitation right that's sort of a not so great side effect of ketamine. Can I tell you a funny story? Yes, of course you can. So I got my wisdom teeth pulled when I was in college and apparently I woke up strangling my mom. Strangling your mother? Attempting to strangle my mom, yeah. And I think I got ketamine. What a horrible dog. And I don't know what that says about my mental psyche. I was gonna but, say, what's um, hiding in the toilet? No, what's hiding <laughs> behind that very nice um, space? So this. if you ever have to sedate me, Think twice about ketamine. I will. Just I'll remember yeah. that. You, need, you need a med alert bracelet. We're gonna put a med alert bracelet on oh, you. Don't yeah, give me ketamine, and I'll you strangle black you. Black belt too, so you don't. Yeah. Want me oh, to see, to there you. we go. I just, I mm -hmm. So okay. <laughs> you definitely you need it. You need a, you need a I, thing. Some things I don't know what's, what it says about me. I, I feel like I'm a stable person when when I'm conscious. <laughs> Anyway, so for apnea, right, we know this respiratory depression happens with benzos. So, <laughs> I see your look on your face. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'm you're scaring me now. But I, I can picture it, which is the scary thing. Like, how can I picture that? I can picture that. Okay, go ahead. I know, my poor mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then aspiration, we know, is a bad thing that happens with the benzos and the opiates, right? Bradycardia, interestingly, can happen with the Tomidate. Should you pull that out? I like pulling out Tomidate for, like, the cardio version yeah, of the patient we had yeah. talked about earlier. Because it's quick. It's right there. It's in the crash cart. So, uh, you're bringing it anyway. Hemodynamically stable. Right. Nice. Right. Still happens that bradycardia with the benzos and the opiates. The hypotension thing that we all dread, right, happens, again, with the benzos and the opiates and the propofol, right? And I always Propofol. To, propofol. And I always like to have the fluids ready to go like you know primed and, go and yeah. ready and connected if necessary right and then hypoxia we know we try our best to prevent this we give supplemental O2 and watch with end title intubation you know that's always something we worry about have it set up because when you have it set up you don't need it i love it, it just like it really doesn't happen yeah it really doesn't happen and i think that 1.6 is high yeah that's interesting yeah. um lingual spasms right we worry about this you know more so i think with like ketamine but you know it doesn't doesn't really happen that often it doesn't and you can and you can blow past it with bag bag valve masks. Right, so. right, right. Kind of get through it, and then the vomiting here too. We talked about that's more often than ketamine. That's not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just picturing myself waking up, trying to strangle my mom, and vomiting. Like I just. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Oh, this is where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so back to the ASAP policy, right? So you're going to do sedation in a monitored setting as much as you can, right? Patients should be evaluated before, during, and after sedation. So this is after. a key. Before and after, like, I think sometimes we forget that component. And, and that's, where they, and that's where they crash. Right, 
Right, right. Like That's we're like, high five, procedure's done, bye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pain's done and now they're not breathing. Right, right. And um, right, and really, um, again, supporting the people doing this hard work, right? Creating the institutional and departmental yeah. guidelines on supporting this process, that making sure they know your heart, to do. That whole guideline thing, institutional <laughs> guidelines. She's glowing over here. She loves that. I, I I don't know. I actually like every time I see guidelines and protocols and policies, I I like can't decide if I love them or hate them. It's a little bit of you both, love probably. Them. You love them. Do you, do I'm just saying <laughs> that's her job. Okay. Anyway. All right, so, so these are the things you should have guidelines on. I just won't. Yeah, I get it. I think we should. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, uh, EPs, right, so physicians and nursing should collaborate on all these set policies, procedures, et cetera. And I think specifically the nursing roles and their ability to administer sedative agents is key. Because I think that, like, people rely more often yeah. than not on the provider to really own that. But they're part of the process and oftentimes are eyes and ears when we're busy doing the procedure. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that they're on board and know that that's part of their role. Well, and, and it all, yeah, and this administrator, administer part is important, too. Yes. You know, oh, for a long true. time. It was like, no, the you doctors do it. The doctors have to do it. It's like, okay, I've got stuff. I'm like up here. Doing it's like, hold on. Like, I was like, okay, you can do it. Ready. Like, you yeah. want me to what now? Yeah. And I'm not an expert at pushing drugs, frankly. I mean, it's not my, it's seriously. Not, yeah. I mean, I can, but I want there. That, that, I'm yeah. just not as, I don't do it as much. Totally yeah. It's totally true. It's weird that I mean, it's, it's not, it's not being like pushing. ducking the, the job, but it's like, <laughs> I don't push them that often. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then uh, nurses should demonstrate competency, right, for these specific drugs. Yeah. All right, what do the British people say about this? Right, so the Royal College of EM Best Practices on procedural sedation in the ED. So it says that every ED should have a sedation lead. So this is kind of similar to like the, having the pediatric readiness champion, to having like a True. specific person that really is responsible for all the things around how to do sedation, the governance, like keeping things sedation updated. Lead. That sounds British, doesn't it? It does sound. Hey, we need a sedation lead <laughs> because we have to have appropriate governance structures in place. <laughs> That's a really impressive accent. See, that's say. it. A seda and a pediatric sedation need. I just carry on. I want to keep listening. <laughs> See, but even the wording is British, right? <laughs> a checklist is strongly recommended. And I get that. I think yeah, this is that, right. I thought I do. I mean, I'm anytime we're doing something that. where you have the risk of airway, like, to have a checklist to this, you know. And then a process should be in place to report adverse events and incidents. And this is sort of a great way to do performance improvement, to like, oh, what happened here? What can we do yeah. better next time? Yeah. Right? Having a learning system in place so that we can get better. So, okay, still going on the, the British. All right, so here we have, they should have clear, I'm gonna try, okay. Clear policies and competency. Now, see, I'm terrible, I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> For procedural sedation and adults in English. <laughs> So up-to-date lists of clinicians fulfilling competencies, right? Like you have to have a list of everyone that's trained and competent on this. And then I love, again, the idea of simulation. So being able to go through it, manage the complications yes. right around that. I agree. Finding all the things um, that you need to have ready, like end title or, you know, whatever it is you want to have at bedside. And then sedation should take place in a designated area of the ED with appropriate staffing and equipment. That, I, sh that should be a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer, but, it's, kind but of, it's hard to do It sometimes. is sometimes. It's hallway. really hard to do, right? Like, hallway. you know, the era of overcrowding, like sometimes mm -hmm. to get a nurse that is trained and to have a moment as a physician and then to have, sometimes you gotta have a, bring a consultant down to get all the stars to align. In a monitor bed. In a monitor bed. It's really hard these days. It is very hard. By uh, the way, if you're, if you're from across the pond and I'm, I didn't mean to offend you saying we're going back to English, we're going back to American English. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mute, please. Please continue. <laughs> Trying not to offend I don't want to offend anybody. I just, I was sitting here thinking, oh, I just, I'm sure we just offended somebody. Aww. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so for careful consideration of analgesia, right? And the key here is that not every sedation medication has analgesia. And so you want to make sure you're still treating pain. Yeah. And that's our, we know the, we need to know the pharmacology. Exactly. Things that just aren't, don't right. have any pain thing to them at all, like propofol. Right. And then this, you know, this is sort of talking about that pre-procedure assessment, right? A safety brief with all the team members with roles assigned, et cetera. And then, um, Use of oxygen during sedation is encouraged, especially in high-risk patients and yeah. those undergoing deep sedation. And it's a fine line, right? Like sometimes we intend yeah. moderate and we, oh, it is. It is definitely. we go to deep and, you know, we don't mean it. And so, you know, I think having oxygen on and tidal yeah. CO2 on or, you know, all those types of things are yeah, very it's a, this, this was controversial for a while. People were doing research saying don't do it because you want to know if they start to desaturate, that you're over sedating. Because some people are saying, well, why not do it? Because yeah. if you do I mean, over, why not? Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> So encourage is a good word because yeah. it's not like a must be done. Right. But, yeah. Right. 
Right, exactly. Right. And it's not like you're leaving it on for an extended amount of time. No. Like it's just during the procedure and then right. you're done. Okay. And then the monitoring should include through the three lead EKG or the cardiac monitor, right? Obviously monitor O2 saturations, continuous capnography. I'm putting a plug in there because that, you know, for a while wasn't really a clear thing that we should be having ready. Right. And then um, measuring blood pressure. Right. Written patient information is encouraged. Yes, we should be sending them home on discharge instructions with what happened and, and informing them, like, you know, the things that can happen, those certain medication that you chose. Right. Switching gears to being American. So the clinical yes. policy. And this is back in 2014. This is the old, this is the old one. Policy. Right. But it's helpful to reiterate because I think it still comes up. Sometimes. It is. And this is kind of the bedrock upon which everything else has been kind of added yeah. to. So. Right. right. And really carving out that, like, we can do this. Mm -hmm. We can do this oh, safely. Of course. Yeah. And stop it. Yeah, go away. <laughs> Step off. <laughs> Quit bugging us. So do not delay procedural sedation based on fasting time, right? This is a... Oh, you know, my gosh, the amount of time we spend Oh, my God. This. Hemming and hawing and be like, when did you last eat? And like, should we sedate? Like, the, yeah. the, for a brief amount of time that we're talking about, like the aspiration risk from eating or drinking, like, I mean, if you have like a giant burrito right before you broke your arm, okay, maybe I might wait a little bit. And you're going to take some time to mobilize anyway. But there's really no reason to delay based on fasting time, mm -mm. especially if that procedure is emergent or urgent. Don't that, do it. That's for sure. Right. That is, uh, that's absolutely for sure. Right. Capnography may be used as an adjunct to oxygen. And, so, and you know, this, the idea being that, like, you can detect the hypoventilation based on reading sort of the, you know, the, how the capnography looks if it starts to l less less sort of mm -hmm. high. You, you can kind of sense when that hypoxia is coming. You can intervene earlier, right? Better than pulse ox alone. And then, you know, during sedation and analgesia, a nurse or other qualified individual should be present to continuously monitor the patient. Yes. So, right, you want the person to be watching the vitals while you're busy with the procedure. Yeah. That, and that's, that, that is a bit of a problem in some places to have two individuals, one who's dedicated to, the, to watching that and one who's dedicated to getting the procedure done. Right. But it's still recommended. It's not a mandatory thing. It used to be. Right. It's recommended. Right. But now this is really saying that, like, someone else, like a nurse, should right. be really the one helping you out there. So going on, so consultants in the ED performing sedation should coordinate with the ED staff with the requirements, right? Like, like I said, it takes so much time. So this one actually, I think, should be capitalized and <laughs> extra bolded and underlined 16 times. Because this is, I mean, how many times have yeah. you had a, a consultant come in and start per, sedating somebody when you're not even in there and they're starting, I want I, I only like three seconds to relocate yeah. the such and such and they're not on all the stuff and then, it, yeah. oh, it's a nightmare. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think they, they like, fully understand stand the stand back from the patient. Behind mm -hmm. it, right? Like mm -hmm. these are, they are very, very blase. Single, single focus. Well, because we make side. it easy for them all the time. Right. It's like so easy for them. Right. And majority of times it goes well. It does. And we're up there because watching it when it happens. Right. 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 And I say, so don't, don't let them come charge That is one of my pet peeves. That yeah. is, it's like, okay, are you kidding me? We Go. share the patient. Yeah. It is, it is actually <laughs> my patient that you're consulting on. Exactly. Mine. <laughs> I'm not going to let you that. <laughs> and then it talks about here the agents that can be safely given to children and adults mm -hmm. for sedation and analgesia in the ED. Right? Yeah. So and if you look at the paper, if you actually pull the paper and look at this thing, it's like uh, it, there's a little bit of nuances on all of these. But if you just pull it all out, yeah. it's like these are the things you can safely go ahead and give right. to adults and kids. Ketamine, propofol, tomidate, the combination of ketofol and however you want to do it. And then this alt, alfentanil. alfentanil that for adults. Kind of, yeah, for adults. Yeah. So um, this is a nice chart kind of giving you the dosing, the yeah, onset, nice the reference. pros and cons. So you can kind of think through what is better for the patient and scenario that you have. Yeah. Right. And then the fentanyl, the key piece here is that's great pain control. The Remy fentanyl here, I just want to call it like the duration piece and the onset piece is very different from our kind of traditional fentanyl, mm -hmm. right? So it's much faster onset. I think Remy fentanyl rapid. Um, and so you, it gets in there um, uh, relatively quickly. And then, you know, here the fentanyl lasts much longer. And then agar again, the R is sort of, it's fast off. Um, for the Remy fentanyl. It's interesting. I don't think a fentanyl is lasting 40 minutes, actually. I, I would have to, I believe it, but I, uh, clinically, it doesn't seem to no, last. No, I think like it's like 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. it's like 10 to it's, 20. It's so that seems, a long, it seems long to me in this one. That's mm -hmm. what's in the, in the actual paper, but mm -hmm. that seems a little long. Yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, midazolam we talked about before, right, has lots of risks in terms of respiratory depression, right, and you um, really have a lot of sedative properties only and, yeah, there. Yeah, no analgesia. No analgesia. So that's why oftentimes you're hearing people give, like, the fentanyl with the midazolam together. Yeah, you stop breathing. 
Yeah, yeah. so, so it's just it's, bad, it's, bad combo. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, if you give it, you know, the pros are it's rapid and onset, it's short duration, and you can give it in multiple routes. Um, you know, nitrous, don't forget nitrous. Nitrous is awesome. <laughs> nitrous is awesome, and it's great, and it's rapid on it, and it's sort of self controlled. Self administered, yeah. Right? The patient, too, just know that you get some emesis issues sometimes, and then it is a gas that's not supposed to be there, so you kind of get those complications and our alveoli and such. So moving on, so automate, right? You got the onset here, great med. So really it's the half dose of half what dose, we would use yeah. for intubation, for induction. And the idea here that it's great because you don't have really any cardiovascular impacts. Mm -hmm. It's nice. You do you're get less, some, but it's some, less. less. Yeah. yeah. And then um, you, you do get, of course, respiratory depression. You get the myoclonus, as we all see when we intubate. Um, again, only sedation properties here. Propofol, right, so you have the risks of the hypotension that you don't see as much with the other drugs and then the usual respiratory depression. You do get some of that discomfort with the injection pain, that burning sensation, you so do. good to give the patient a heads up before you put them under so they're not cursing you when you wake up. And then, again, sedation properties only here. So this is where you and I differ as far as what, how we respond to sedatives. So you came out of yours and strangled your mother. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. I had knee surgery done under with propofol as one of the drugs. Oh, yeah. I, I came, apparently, I don't know exactly what happened, except that I heard through the grapevine that I propositioned the anesthesiologist oh. with very specific things I was willing to do. <laughs> so that's the difference between oh, your mind God. and mine. <laughs> Yeah, apparently every time he would walk through the ER while I was working, he'd give me this like wink, wink thing. I was like, oh my God, what? That happened in there. Yeah, so there we go. So be careful. There is a sexual, so sexual disinhibition that happens with propofol. So if somebody makes a pass at you while they're under propofol, don't be flattered. It's the drug. Yeah. It's the drug. <laughs> My, I, I, just to pause, I know we're talking about adult procedural sedation, but my favorite thing to ask kids especially is just like, what were you thinking when you were under? I kind of ask it of the adults, oh, depending on yeah. what their vibe is. Maybe sometimes I don't want to know, but like, it's great. I feel like kids the have answers their imagination. Fascinating. fascinating. I had one kid who was like, Buzz Lightyear was putting on my cast and it was just like totally <laughs> like really. I was like, I'm, you're tripping like, but you're seem like you're having a good one. <laughs> Anyway, so ketofol is great. This was really, really kind of the fad for a while. Of yeah, like, and it isn't anymore. It isn't anymore because mm -hmm. it's not as, it, frankly, I think it depends on how you feel, but this can be kind of a pain to set up, to have two drugs, to have to kind of keep track of, and like, who, what did you give when? And the it's a thought, It's a mixture. It's a it's a one-to-one, -one, basically. It's a, yeah, exactly. It's a one-to-one, -one, and you can either put it in the same syringe, or you could have two separate syringes. Ketamine, propofol. Ketamine, propofol. And, and then the idea is that they're adverse sort of um, events, and the pros and the cons sort of balance each other. In theory. In theory. But it, it doesn't. So the propofol hypotension was balanced by the ketamine, ketamine increasing too. your blood pressure. Exactly. The propofol antiemetic was balancing the ketamine, make you throw up and strangle your right. mother. Great in concept. Yeah, but it turns out it's, it didn't. It didn't I'll offer that much more yeah, than just either yeah. drug alone. Yeah, I am jumping the gun a little bit, but we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. So procedural sedation is a core competency of emergency medicine. So, so everyone step off. Yeah. And then alternatives to sedation should be considered, right? Definitely. I mean, there's always pros and cons and, and you know, we just went through a whole bunch of side effects. Nerve blocks. Nerve awesome. blocks are great. And if you know how to do them and do them and calculate the right doses of the anesthetic. Awesome. And know the anatomy, it's great. Minimal adverse effects. And then there is a spectrum of sedation, right? And, you know, especially when we're sort of yeah. getting deeper, you get more risk. And, and sometimes you, you don't, you go deep because it's deeper and you didn't mean you didn't to get to. there. Right, right. So be prepared. Be prepared, exactly. And that's why, like, you have, if you're prepared, you won't need it. That's and true. So, yeah, that's so true. You just say it. And then, you know, the idea that of being NPO for, before sedation has not been shown to actually reduce any adverse events. Nope. And then there's a wide range of agents and know all the That's the fun part. Yeah, know all the sort of details around the how long it lasts, Pick the why you, you give, in which situation. Um, and then, you know, you'll you'll do great and the sedation will be great and the patient will be better off for it. It's true. So uh, there's no specific agent or combination that is better than the other. So you really got to think about the scenario. Yeah, that's why you get to choose really any of those. Yeah. Which is nice. Then, right. And you, you kind of remember that not every sedation medication has analgesia. And most yeah, of them don't. So you want to make really sure important. you're still giving we pain control that. like fentanyl. And then talk to the patient about the risks and the benefits. Do you want sedation or would you rather have a nerve block? If you do want sedation, this is the drug I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And this is the, you know, the risks and the benefits here. And then, although the adverse events are rare, you still want to plan for them. 
And then really the most common events are vomiting, hypoxia and hypotension or being overly sexual or aggressive. Apparently, yes. Apparently. And by the way, the vomiting um, is, not, is not associated with aspiration. Um, yes. The vomiting tends to happen once the patient is awake enough that everything coming. is protecting their right. own airway. So it tends to be just more discomfort than a real risk to the person.